A common question that comes up in my practice as a board certified dermatologist and acne expert is which treatment is better for adult women with acne? Oral antibiotics like doxycycline and minocycline, or what we might call hormonal therapy, things like spironolactone and combined oral contraceptives. In this video, I wanna break down the recent FASTI trial, which was a study conducted in France, which compared doxycycline versus spironolactone for the treatment of women with acne. In this study, 133 women were, who were on average were 28 years old, were randomized to receive either spironolactone, 150 milligrams per day, or doxycycline, 100 milligrams per day. In both groups, the participants also used a 5% benzoyl peroxide product. In the doxycycline group, I think an attempt to reflect guidelines that suggest limiting the use of oral antibiotics at three to four months in duration, the doxycycline was stopped after three months, and for the remaining three months of the study, only the benzoyl peroxide product was used. In the spironolactone arm, spironolactone was continued for the duration of the study. The investigators in this trial, the primary endpoint that they looked at was called an AFAS score, which is an investigator global assessment, sort of a gestalt of how acne was doing. And they were looking at treatment success, so kind of achieving clear, almost clear skin. What they found was that at four and six months after starting the treatments, those in the spironolactone group had greater rates of treatment success than those in the doxycycline group. They also saw slightly better improvements in whiteheads and blackheads and inflammatory pimples as well. Now, one thing that you might initially say is, wait a minute here, the doxycycline group was only three months long via treatment and they stopped and they're looking at the outcomes at four and six months. So in a way, they're comparing really spironolactone versus no treatment, at least at that time, especially at six months when potentially those benefits of oral antibiotics have worn off. And that is an important limitation of this study. Now, they did also look at outcomes at two months. And when you look at two months, spironolactone and doxycycline are quite similar with respect to treatment mix success and also lesion counts, kind of whiteheads and blackheads and inflammatory papules and pustules. So it does suggest that at least spironolactone and doxycycline are probably not inferior to each other. And kind of in a study that's reflecting to some degree real world practice where we might try to limit our use of oral antibiotics, spironolactone is actually superior to using oral antibiotics in that group. When it comes to side effects, both of these treatments were well tolerated in the trial. There were not really much significant safety signals that were observed. In the spironolactone arm, about 12% of people had dysmenorrhea and irregular menstrual periods, and another 12% of people also just had irregular menstrual periods on top of that initial group. So about a quarter of people did have irregular periods in this study. And I think this may reflect the dose of spironolactone. We know from Allison Layden's work that when spironolactone is used at doses over 100 milligrams per day, the rates of irregular menstrual periods and other menstrual side effects are much higher than at doses 100 milligrams a day or lower. And if we look at the SAFA trial, which was another study comparing spironolactone versus placebo versus no treatment, but the spironolactone dose was only 100 milligrams per day, in that study we really didn't see any of these irregular menstrual cycle type of side effects. So this higher rate of side effects in the study may reflect the higher dose of spironolactone that was used. In addition, very few of the individuals in the study were on a combined oral contraceptive pill. Many more were using an IUD or a hormonal implant in terms of contraception. And from Allison Lane's work again, we know that rates of irregular menstrual periods can be reduced by about fourfold in those who are taking a combined oral contraceptive with spironolactone. And so the lower rates of use of combined oral contraceptive in the study population may have predisposed people to higher rates of having menstrual side effects. The investigators did look at outcomes stratified by contraception class, and they didn't find any differences in terms of how well people's acne cleared, but they didn't present data on side effects. And that would be something that'd be interesting to see if there maybe are meaningful differences by contraception class, and potentially if we're using higher doses of spironolactone, like 150 or 200 milligrams a day, if using different contraception approaches might be helpful to address some of those side effects. In the study, they also didn't observe any rates of hyperkalemia, high potassium in the spironolactone group. Now there are only 71 people in this arm, so it's a very small sample size of draft conclusions, but it's reassuring to see that there aren't any evidence of concerning safety signals with respect to hyperkalemia in this population. That goes along with a lot of observational data we have from many different individual studies suggesting that spironolactone is not associated with meaningful increases in hyperkalemia, high potassium in young healthy women who are treating for acne. So what can we take away from the study? Well, the first thing is, you know, if we're trying to decide between a treatment like spironolactone or oral antibiotics for an adult woman with acne, I think these data do support that spironolactone might be a better place to start 
We know that adult women with acne about 50% while back in their 20s, about 30% in their 30s. So this can be quite persistent for sometimes years. And so we do wanna think about treatments that are gonna have good long-term effectiveness and safety. We know that oral antibiotics are not a disease modifying treatment. They're not gonna change the course of disease. They'll help while you're on them. But once you stop, acne is gonna go back to however it was gonna be otherwise. So in a population where we anticipate potentially needing longer term treatments, something like spironolactone might make more sense. And these data support that, you know, if we think about kind of a standard practice use case, spironolactone seems to potentially deliver better outcomes, at least under these conditions. However, similar to other studies, this work suggests that 150 milligrams per day might be on the higher side of dosing. In my practice, I often try to start more around 100 milligrams per day and then go up over time as needed if there's incomplete improvement. I think when you go above 100 milligrams per day, you start to get a lot higher rates of side effect and the effectiveness doesn't increase that much. And so potentially 100 milligrams a day might be a better starting place for most individuals with acne than 150 milligrams per day. And I think you see that in the higher rates of menstrual side effects in this study. And so that's another important kind of take home point when we think about dosing. And we go into dosing in some of the other spironolactone videos on the channel, as well as other studies and evidence around where to start. But I still kind of think this supports my approach of trying to start around 100 milligrams per day and if you know, side effects going down and if not quite complete clearance, then going up even to 200 milligrams per day, which can be quite helpful for many people. The other important context for the study is that when we talk to patients with acne, many of them are looking for a non-antibiotic alternative. In a survey of those who are being treated for acne, 75% would prefer a non-antibiotic option if such a treatment were available. And these data, along with the data from the SAFA trial and some observational studies from our group, which I'll put down links below, really support that spironolactone can be a very effective treatment for adult women with acne. It's probably on par in terms of effectiveness to oral antibiotics for treating adult women with acne. And it may have a better side effect profile. In general, at doses of 100 milligrams a day or less, most people really have little to no meaningful side effects. Almost everyone can tolerate that dose in the SAFA trial. And then we avoid the issues of long-term antibiotic use of disrupting the gut microbiome, just the acute side effects of stomach upset and yeast infections. And then potentially some of these risks that we worry about, like increased risk of colon cancer and inflammatory bowel disease that we can see with long-term exposure to oral antibiotics. So in summary, I'm excited to have these new comparative effectiveness data to help guide us in the management of acne. We have another trial that's ongoing called the SD Acne Trial, which compares spironolactone 100 milligrams a day with doxycycline 100 milligrams a day, and we're hoping to enroll around 300 to 400 women with acne. So when those results are finished, I think they'll add even more information to help us figure out what is the best treatment for adult women with acne. But I think this study adds the growing body of evidence that spironolactone and other hormonal therapies like combined oral contraceptives and topical clascoderone, which is a topical antiandrogen, can be great options for adult women with acne to really address that fundamental hormonal pathogenesis of acne that's true for all acne. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, please give it a like so we can share it with more in the community and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on the latest in acne and rosacea. In addition, ask your questions and share your experiences with spironolactone and oral antibiotics in the comments below. Until next time, see ya.